A romantic union between two people should be an exciting and joyful occasion. But marriage doesn't always lead to a happy ending. And the worst outcome isn't always divorce. Sometimes tying the knot ends in murder. In today's episode, we'll be taking a look at two cases where a blissful beginning ended in tragedy as we examine two chilling cases of killer husbands. William and Helen Marlene Major. In October of 1980, 25-year-old Marlene Oakes lived in the rural town of Verona, Kentucky, in a small trailer with her husband, William Bill Major, and their two children, Donald and Lalana. Despite it having been nine years since they tied the knot, their union had been anything but blissful. Marlene was just 16 when she'd married Bill, a mechanic 10 years her senior. The couple argued frequently and heatedly, and their marriage had become so corroded that they had both taken to having extramarital affairs. In the months leading up to her disappearance, Marlene had been carrying on with Glenn St. Hilaire, a man who lived on their property and was employed by her husband. The couple had met Glenn when his truck broke down as he traveled from Ohio to Texas, and he lived in a separate mobile home on the property. Bill reportedly encouraged this relationship, and it was rumored that he too had somebody on the side, which is why he was so relaxed about the affair. However, there is also speculation that Marlene's affair allowed Bill more alone time with the children, whom he frequently abused. While things in the relationship had never been good, tensions rose and nerves became particularly frazzled when Marlene discovered Bill was sexually assaulting their son, Donald. Horrifically, Bill had been convicted back in 1975 of molesting two boys. Alarmed by what she had witnessed and afraid for the safety of her children, Marlene made plans to leave the home with the two children and to get away from Bill. In her diary, she wrote, I know what I saw. I told him not to touch me ever again, and if he touched Donald, I'll kill him. I could be the biggest whore to walk the streets of Verona, and no judge would dare to give him custody of my kids before me. It seems that Marlene's confrontation served to irk Bill, however, who reportedly told several individuals afterwards that if she ended the relationship, he would kill her. He then detailed the steps he would take to make her body unidentifiable, including pushing her car into a body of water and dismembering her corpse. Marlene, for her part, handed her diaries over to Glenn to make sure that Bill couldn't get to them and destroy them, as they would serve as important evidence should anything untoward happen to her. She had made a note inside her journal that her husband had agreed to sign the divorce papers as long as she did not out him for the sexual abuse of their children. Marlene also told her sister that she planned to divorce Bill and informed her of the abuse Donald had suffered at the hands of his own father. Despite her precautions though, Marlene's plan didn't pan out as she'd hoped. On October 11th, 1980, she had a heated argument with Bill. Glenn reportedly left the property to cool off, and when he returned at around 12 a.m., he found the home in shambles. Bill had dropped the children off at a neighbor's, but he informed Glenn that Marlene had taken off with her children in tow. Bill subsequently gave away several of his guns and spoke about how much he wanted to move back to Rhode Island, his home state. However, Glenn found out in the following days that the children were at a neighbor's house and he knew that Marlene would not abandon them. He subsequently reported her disappearance to the police. The only thing missing from the scene was Marlene's car and her driver's license had been left behind. Bill told his two young children that their mother had left them due to her involvement with drugs, alcohol, and sex work. The children were aged just four and eight at the time. 
While authorities thought it was possible the 25-year-old had left due to an unhappy marriage, they also acknowledged that her diaries detailed reasons why Bill might want to get rid of her. Still, with no signs of foul play, investigators were unable to arrest and charge her husband. The diaries alone were not sufficient evidence. Both Glenn and Bill denied involvement in Marlene's disappearance. When asked to take a polygraph test, Bill refused. Shortly afterwards, he moved to Portucket, Rhode Island, with the children. He'd often take one of them to work and subject them to abuse during work hours. On November 29th, 1981, over a year after Marlene went missing, a hunter discovered a partial skull just one mile from the major residence. The skull showed that the death had come as a result of at least one gunshot, which had gone through the face and exited out the top of the head, and further examinations revealed that the victim was a white woman around the age of 30. The skull was mostly missing the face, along with the jaw and teeth. Evidence of dismemberment was also visible. That same year, Bill remarried. His second wife described him as abusive and reported to police in 1984 that he was sexually and physically abusive towards her children. She discovered this after they revealed that Bill had threatened to kill one of the siblings if the other ever reported his abuse. He also, at one point, threatened his own daughter at gunpoint, telling her to keep her mouth shut. Bill was subsequently arrested and convicted in 1985, where he was given 15 years behind bars. Meanwhile, Dolland and Lalana moved in with Marlene's mother. Bill served just 11 years of his sentence and was released in 1996. While Kentucky officials wanted to charge him with other crimes, insufficient evidence and the statute of limitations prevented them from doing so. Despite the lack of charges though, it was confirmed that he had sexually abused two other boys. While living with their maternal grandmother, Lalana became interested in determining what happened in 1981 when their mother disappeared. Marlene's mother was convinced Bill was responsible. Though Lalana reportedly confronted her father and demanded to know where Marlene was buried, he told her, if you think I'm going to tell you where your mother is buried, you're crazy. While Lalana searched for her mother on her own, even accessing Boone County police files pertaining to her mother's case when she was 20, she was unable to find further evidence that would tell her where Marlene was. It wasn't until 2001 that Marlene was finally linked to the skull that had been found near the family home 20 years earlier. Lalana submitted mitochondrial DNA so that it could be tested against the skull. Results showed that she was maternally related to the person the skull belonged to. Months later, Bill's father, Jim, agreed to work with law enforcement to help them gather evidence. Years earlier, he had told investigators that his son had confessed to killing his wife, but authorities needed corroborating evidence to charge him. By all accounts, Jim had no love for his son, acknowledging that he was a pedophile and, quote, no good, he's no asset to anyone. Upon finding out that Bill would face the death penalty for his crime, he added, I'll pull the effing switch if they need me to. They secretly recorded a call between Bill and his father, where Bill admitted to everything. He killed his wife, buried her body in a sinkhole, threw away the gun, and pushed her car into the Ohio River. He said he was completely unfazed by the killing. Following his arrest, Bill claimed that Marlene had threatened him with a gun, which resulted in him losing his temper, shooting her twice in the face and four times in the torso. He was charged with Marlene's murder, and his children, now grown adults, testified about the abuse they'd suffered at his hands. Ultimately, Bill was convicted and given life in prison. He reportedly died in 2017, still behind bars. Perry and Janet March Janet Gail Levine met Perry March through a mutual friend while attending the University of Michigan. Though peers of Perry's described him as having some rough edges, it wasn't long before Janet fell under his spell, completely charmed by the Indiana native two years her senior. The couple soon became inseparable, and after graduation, Perry began working in Chicago. Janet joined him, taking art classes at the Art Institute, 
but she began to feel homesick, and so the pair returned to her home state of Tennessee, where Janet's parents footed the bill for Perry's tuition while he attended Vanderbilt University Law School. Following graduation, he began working at the law firm Base, Berry and Sims. Meanwhile, Janet became an illustrator for children's books. Perry and Janet tied the knot in 1987. They went on to have two children together, the first of whom was born in 1990. Around the same time that the pair married, Perry's father, Arthur, moved to Nashville to be closer to his son. Janet's parents were known to be generous with their wealth. When Arthur's home back in Michigan was foreclosed on, they purchased the property and leased it back to him. However, records show that they ended the lease for non-payment of rent in early 87. Still, when he moved to Nashville, the Levines allowed Arthur to move in with them and even lent him money so that he could find his footing and establish himself in the city. But despite their financial help, Arthur declared himself bankrupt in 1991. That same year, cracks in the union between Janet and Perry began to show. A paralegal at Perry's workplace began receiving anonymous typewritten letters from a secret admirer. The letters were somewhat explicit, complimenting the woman's body as the writer noted that her looks captivated them. The writer also spoke of sexual scenarios, describing their desire to perform oral sex on her. They mentioned that they were married, and stated that while they'd previously not understood men who engaged in extramarital affairs, quote, marriage has a way of making sex boring at times, routine, and old. Obviously alarmed by the letters, the paralegal reached out to management, who devised a plan which involved the woman penning her own note for the writer, where she expressed an interest in wanting to carry out an affair, despite his marital status. Management then set up a hidden camera to get a look at whoever was leaving the correspondence, and it was discovered that Perry March was behind it all. Perry was given two options. He could resign, or he could be fired. However, his employers stipulated that he could only resign if he agreed to seek professional help following his exit from the company. Perry was given some time to think about the ultimatum, much to the frustration of the paralegal on the other end of his sexual harassment, who quit her job when she returned from holiday to find he was still employed. Ultimately, Perry was fired from his position. After his removal from the company, though, he agreed to pay 25000 to the paralegal so that his former employer could avoid a sexual harassment lawsuit. While he kept the payments, and the real reason he lost his job, a secret from Janet, the two began seeing a marriage counselor together. Perry wasn't jobless for long. He was soon hired by Janet's father, who had his own law firm. Three years later, in 1994, the couple moved into the wealthy suburb of Forest Hills, and Janet gave birth to their second child. By this time, though, the pair were continuing to have marital troubles, and nothing had improved their issues. Not the new house, not the new baby, and not the fact that they were seeking professional help. The two were seeing separate psychiatrists, but Perry began spending more and more time away from home. Friends at the time spotted him on several occasions in the company of other women, and he even asked a wealthy client of his if he could move into his spare condo. The couple's arguments became more frequent, and though they began seeing a couple's counselor again, it didn't help matters. In fact, they argued so much during their sessions that the counselor suggested a trial separation. In one of their last sessions together, Janet asked Perry again why he had to leave his former employer, as she was suspicious of the circumstances surrounding his exit from the law firm. Perry claimed, as he had when he'd originally been fired, that he'd left due to a conflict with a co-worker. On August 14th, 1996, the day before Janet vanished, the children's nanny noticed that the mother of two was much quieter and more withdrawn than usual. Janet told her she'd be working on the computer all day and closed the door behind her when she went into the office. This was reportedly abnormal behavior for Janet. Friends who spoke with her that day recalled that she seemed distracted and a little afraid of her husband. She and her mother booked an appointment with a divorce lawyer for August 16th. According to Perry, on August 15th, he and Janet began arguing after the children were in bed. At around 8 p.m., he offered to go to a hotel for the night. However, Janet allegedly announced that she was leaving for a short holiday and refused to tell him where. 
Perry claimed that the 33-year-old mother of two packed some clothes into two bags and a suitcase, climbed into her car, and drove off at around 8.30 p.m. He stated that she'd left a list behind of things that needed to be done in her absence, and that she'd gotten into her car with $1,500, her passport, and a bag of marijuana. Half an hour later, Perry's phone records show that he called family and friends to let them know that Janet had left him with the children. He first called his own siblings, then a lifelong friend of Janet's, before finally alerting her parents at around midnight. Her parents were skeptical of the story, as it seemed unlike Janet to simply walk out, even after an argument, but decided to believe Perry's word and asked him to ask her to call when she returned. However, the following day, regulars to the couple's family home observed some strange behavior. The cleaner, who arrived between 8 and 8.30 a.m., later testified that the house appeared to have already been cleaned and that Perry had instructed her not to touch the children's playroom. He also told her that Janet was in California on business. Then when the nanny arrived between 9.30 and 10 a.m., he told her that Janet was in California but on a trip to visit her brother, who was in LA at the time. The nanny later told investigators that Janet never left without letting her know her plans beforehand and that she'd always leave her some instructions, so she found it odd that the mother of two had failed to do either of these things. The third visitor that day was a mother whose son had a playdate with Janet and Perry's eldest child, Samson. The mother was not greeted by Perry, but by Samson, who noted that his own mother was absent. When she returned to pick up her child that afternoon, she overheard Perry talking about how he needed to replace the carpet in his office. Two days after Janet was last seen, her parents grew concerned. Their daughter had never left her children before without telling anyone. While they wanted to call the police, Perry, alongside his brother who'd come to help out, persuaded them to wait 12 days, as Janet had supposedly said she'd be gone for that long. Around this same time, Perry called his father to let him know about the situation. Arthur was now living in Mexico, but arrived several days later to help run the household in Janet's absence. According to a later court filing, on August 23rd, Perry began searching for a criminal defense attorney whose services he wanted to retain. When Janet hadn't returned for her son's birthday on August 25th, Janet's parents, again, felt that something was deeply wrong. They claimed Perry resisted calling the authorities, while Perry alleged that the Levines didn't want to notify the police in case they embarrassed Janet. On August 29th, the police were finally notified of the disappearance. Investigators found no trace of Janet when they began looking into her abrupt disappearance. Her bank accounts and credit cards had not been accessed, and she had not been admitted to hospital from what they could find. On September 7th, they discovered the 33-year-old's car backed into a parking space at an apartment complex around five miles from the March residence. Inside were the majority of the things Janet had supposedly left with on the night she'd left Perry. The detective who processed the scene noted that there was a layer of dust and pollen on the exterior, suggesting that the Volvo had been sitting there, unmoved and untouched for some time. Additionally, there were cobwebs in the wheel wells, and the brake rotors had some rust on them. Investigators also noticed that the passenger seat had been pushed back, while the driver's seat was up close to the wheel, and a pair of white sandals found on the floor had been carefully positioned, rather than haphazardly discarded. They also observed that no bras had been packed inside the luggage, and her toiletry bag didn't contain toothpaste or a hairbrush. Meanwhile, the Levines hired a PI who noted that Perry spoke of his wife in the past tense. She then visited the apartment block where the Volvo was found so she could look for witnesses, but was contacted by Perry, who angrily demanded that she fax him a list of everyone she'd spoken to and what they'd said. The police also checked Perry's car during their investigation, and while they said it didn't look particularly clean, it smelled like disinfectant. Hair and fibers were recovered from the back seat. Detectives who spoke with Perry described him as anxious, and he refused to consent to a search of the house. Authorities obtained a search warrant for the property, though, the following weekend, and executed it a day later on September 16th. They discovered that the hard drive of the couple's computer had been forcibly removed. It was never recovered. 
Around this time, they also found that Perry had purchased new tires for his Jeep on August 21st. The store owner recalled that his tires were already brand new, but Perry had insisted because he wanted a different brand. With these last few bits of information in mind, investigators turned their attention to Perry. Over the course of the following few weeks, he moved with the children to Chicago and was overheard making numerous bizarre statements, including stating, fuck the Levines and fuck the Nashville police, and even asking a long-term friend of Janet's what she would think if he told her he'd put Janet's body in the back of the car, driven away while the children slept, and returned like nothing ever happened. Perry also cut off contact with friends, acquaintances, and Janet's family after leaving Tennessee, and didn't attend his wife's memorial service. Perry maintained his innocence, and frequently declared that he was a man who had been wronged, telling the Nashville scene in 1997, I will not allow one misguided police officer, one vengeful man, and a few low-life journalists to destroy what I've taken years to build. By 1999, Perry was living in Mexico with the children and had remarried. Despite rising suspicions, it wasn't until 2005 that Perry was arrested and flown to Los Angeles, where he was collected by the FBI and charged with second-degree murder, tampering with evidence, and abuse of a corpse. In late 2004, cold case detectives and prosecutors had begun presenting evidence against Perry to a grand jury that indicted him on the aforementioned charges. Perry claimed that he would plead guilty if he served no more than seven years in prison. He also asked investigators about the evidence they had against him, whether or not a body had been found, and, hypothetically, if it was still second-degree murder if someone was killed accidentally. Still, he didn't seem to learn anything from being caught, as while he was in jail awaiting trial, Perry attempted to hire a fellow inmate to murder the Levines, who'd gotten custody of the children. In April of 2006, Perry was found guilty of embezzling $23,000 from his father-in-law's firm over the two years before Janet went missing. Two months later, he was convicted of two counts of conspiring to commit murder in relation to his attempt to have the Levines killed. For this plot, he enlisted the help of his father, who was subsequently convicted and put in jail on similar charges. In the following months, despite the absence of Janet's body, Perry was found guilty of second-degree murder, tampering with evidence and abuse of a corpse. His father, Arthur, admitted to helping dispose of Janet's body. Perry killed Janet during an argument and subsequently buried her body in a shallow grave in a wooded area near the home. However, when he heard of plans to build in the area, he had his father help him dig up the body and move it to another location. They buried Janet in Bowling Green, Kentucky, but Arthur was unable to lead investigators to the remains, though police believed his version of events. Perry is still in prison, serving a 56-year sentence. His father, Arthur, died just three months into his five-year sentence. Janet's body is still missing to this day. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.